<laughs> this is Evan Davies. He is the executive producer of The Red Pill, the cinematographer, my therapist, and boyfriend. <laughs> Hi. Kidding about the therapist. He's not the therapist, but. Can be, <laughs> if necessary. Therapist that doesn't get paid. <laughs> I think the most interesting aspect of, of filming and the creation of the Red Pill, at least from my limited uh, hand in it, because in all honesty, Cassie, this is Cassie's movie, this Cassie did everything. Um, I just kind of helped with the camera and technical side and a little bit of color every once in a while, and if we needed to transcode some extra footage, I'd do that. But uh, the most interesting part about experiencing the filming process of this was the way that our dynamic changed and the way that um, we started to respect well I already respected Cassie <laughs> for the housework that she was doing and, and because I'd kind of I'd been dating feminist women all of my adult life and Cassie was to be honest a fairly moderate feminist at the beginning of our relationship she wasn't that horrible um, and there was only the, the minor issues of like I'd come home after a 16 hour day and a 90 hour work week and I'd need to do housework and if I didn't do the housework it was going to be an angry angry night in bed or whatever um, just so the respect that came from her realization that my role was important too was really um, I wasn't expecting it and it was it was vindicating and all of a sudden I'm I felt like our relationship had gone from a great relationship that worked to something that we didn't have to try and make work because we both respected each other's roles now. Um, so that was the most interesting aspect of experiencing the filmmaking process from my end. Less arguments too, I think. Right. Like back when I, I, before I started making The Red Pill, uh, I would get in, I would start so many arguments with you over housework or just work in general and um, and yeah I wasn't understanding your role and contribution to the household and I was only looking at well I went to work all day you went to work all day we got home you relaxed and then I was like oh I got to do laundry I got to cook and because I'm a woman I'm expected to do all these things and yet I wasn't even for some reason, I wasn't even thinking how much financial contribution you made to the household and factoring that into your role. And uh, so, I, I, when I, before making the red pill, I was very like tit for tat, you know, I did this, that, and this, and what do you have to show kind of right. thing. And I could never and bring up the fact that I was paying for everything because that would be. Yeah, and I never even... I didn't want I to because it's a horrible argument to make. It's like, I, I am the person who's paying for the rent and I'm the person who's paying for Dinners the utilities and, and dinner yeah. and utilities, but you're doing all the work at home. And if you make that argument, you're basically saying that you don't contribute because you don't make any money. And that's just, that's not what it is. It's you contribute in your own way. I contribute in my way. And then when I started to ask, because during the red pill, I started to ask myself if I could change roles with Evan would I want to? And when I realized the answer was no, then I realized I was the privileged one. And because he had so much on his shoulders to, and I don't even think, you know, anyone was telling you, but you, you wanted to. You wanted to provide for me. You wanted me to be able to live out my creative endeavors. And, you know, being in a creative field like, field like filmmaking, you do need a partner that's willing to let you do that and support you in that way and that's what Evan was for me and so yeah while making the red pill I you know really the film is because of this man because he supported my pursuing my dreams and my passion and he went to work every day working extreme hours waking up at 4 30 a.m coming home at 11 or 12 p.m or a.m 12 a.m but yeah it's uh it, the, the film really made me understand and respect you so much more, and I'm sorry I didn't do that before. <laughs> and I think that many men have uh, this innate need to provide and help and protect, especially the women in their lives. Not, not necessarily that they won't help the young men and boys in their lives, they will, but it's, there's just this need this kind of nurturing, it's not, the, it's not the mothering nurturing nature, it's the other side of that. It's the providing for, 
uh, just, yeah, mm -hmm. providing for, I guess, is really. I, I think the conversations that we had before I started making the red pill, I, you've always challenged my beliefs and usually it would be on politics or <laughs> technology or economic issues or whatever else, but uh, when I started thinking of making a film about rape culture and I brought up some of the issues to Evan at dinner and he started to pose very rational um, devil's advocate points of view toward, to me and, uh, and I was unwilling to hear what he was saying because I was emotionally triggered from, based on my feminist view of the world. And uh, so I think that was one of the first kind of just pinholes that was you know, made in my wall that was up, uh, that I was unlistening to, uh, unwilling to listen to these other arguments. And he, he poked that little pinhole, and when I f came across a voice for men and thought, these are the misogynists I've been hearing about, I'm gonna make a film about them, this will be entertaining, no one has ever seen this dark side of the internet. And, uh, and then, you know, meeting the MRAs in person and realizing they're not what they're portrayed to be in mass media. And then we had so many conversations while I was filming, filming the red pill. And you grew up in Berkeley, essentially, in like the feminist hubbub yep. of California. Feminist mother and father, and they still are. Yeah. But they're accepting of the film. So. And so we just had so many conversations about the men's issues and about feminism. And, uh, and I also had my mother, who was a producer on the film, and she was on uh, there for a lot of the interviews as well, hearing from MRAs what they had to say and she was really starting to question her feminist views and so just those all combined with my relationship with my mother talking about it with Evan talking about these issues and it was a very long process over many years of getting to where where I am now very understanding of men's issues um, so yeah I think you know if I if we weren't dating when I started the red pill um, I don't, well actually I don't know if the red pill would have been made I don't think it would have been if we weren't dating and you know, and we have such a strong relationship, and had one back then, but even stronger now. So many times I wanted to give up because it was, it, when you question your strong-held belief system, it feels like you're drowning. It feels like you can't breathe and you can't stay above water and you don't know where you're headed and it's, you feel out of control, like you're, you're not even able to control your emotions. You have no idea where you're headed, which is a scary idea. Um, so yeah, you, that's why I say he was part therapist because you kept me sane through, through most of it. Yeah. Most of it. <laughs> I, and there's kind of this underlying uh, concept also, is, is you came out of the church a, long, a while ago now. Um, but that you still wanted to find somewhere to belong mm -hmm. and you still wanted to find a core set of ideals to be able to subscribe to um, because that's safe and now you have uh, people that believe the same thing that you believe so you feel like you're part of a community and then beyond that even is the idea of um, you're not responsible for your own actions if you're in some sort of a religion because you're inherently evil because you're a sinful person and the you need to repent your over. sins to be able to be accepted as a godly person. And I feel like feminism is a very easy transition from that in the sense of now you're not responsible for your own action because you are a victim or you're, uh, you've got... Um, forces against you. Or that you're being treated like a child. Like for instance, <laughs> if you're drunk, you're no longer uh, culpable for your actions. I mean, that's that's essentially mm -hmm. saying that that you have gone so far that I, I don't, it's just it's amazing. It feels like a religion to me. And then when she started coming out of that, there was this I don't know what to believe anymore, and I need something to to align myself to to be able to feel. And I, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but I would also add that it, a, a similar mentality that I had when I was heavily involved in the church to when I was heavily involved with feminism was you approach every conversation as it's your duty to evangelize. You're not there to have your views challenged, you're there to convince the other to believe what you believe. 
And so every conversation I had as a feminist and saying, you know, meeting people who weren't feminists, it was my duty to convert them. And so, you know, the red pill was the opposite. Now here, I'm, I'm not doing these interviews with MRAs to convert them. I'm a documentarian first and foremost before I was a feminist. You know, that was my profession was to be a filmmaker. I was trying to not let my feminist views affect my job of being a balanced filmmaker. Um, so I was just letting MRAs speak and I wasn't there to evangelize to them of the feminist doctrine. Uh, but then everything they were saying when I, I was forced to be silent for audio, to not interrupt them, to not get into arguments with them, now I had to really listen to what they had to say and I had to go through all the footage. I edited the film myself so I saw each interview multiple times. And, uh, and you know, that was really the first time I had to shut up and listen. <laughs> but. Mostly it was the, the idea of, of being angry at me for wanting a career or going to work and not being available to hang out with them on a whim or the, uh, or the, the, the prevalent feminism in high school, which is now that you could have a boyfriend, but if you get sick of that boyfriend, you're going to move on. And then if you get sick of that next guy, you're going to come back. This whole treatment of, of men who really kind of fall in love early as, oh, well, you're just kind of my first boyfriend. I'm going to move on from that. It's just this disparity between the way men and girls, or boys and girls, treat relationships in their young, young stages is men really want to, at least in my, I was kind of clingy. Um, and then it was the whole, uh, get away from me. I want to go be my own, my own girl and then mm -hmm. sleep with all your friends. <laughs> Um, but yeah, mostly it, w mostly it was the whole, I want you to be part of my life and not have your own career. That was the most extremist view that I... And yet also pay for dinner. And yet also <laughs> pay for dinner and et cetera, et cetera. So it's got to come from somewhere. I, I constantly see TV shows, like reality shows, where women are talking, having arguments with their husbands, saying, you work too much, you need to be home with the kids more. And then the next scene is the wife is building this house from scratch and making all, you know, choosing $10,000 granite tile and, uh, and, you know, just spending like crazy, but then shaming the husband for not being at home with the kids more. Uh, I constantly see that now. Yeah, it's, that's the core, the core thing is, oh yeah, you can make the money to be able to pay for my life, but I want you here. Why do you have to go out and make the money? It's yeah. Like, <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> okay, yeah. The, the reason that I stuck with Cassie, even though she was a feminist, um, well, I, I, I fell in love with her immediately, and I knew that, that this person was thoughtful and open to different ideas, and as a documentarian, that was our first conversation. We, we met in a bar after I had just worked a long week on a TV show for HBO, and we started talking about Jesus Camp and a documentary, a documentary about Jesus Camp, yeah. and uh, and that was her inspiration for her first film. And that was kind of a and we just kept talking and talking and talking. And then I realized that she had come there with some guy, so I kind of extracted myself from it because I didn't want to steal her from her potential date. And then it turned out later that she wasn't there with him and that she wanted me to call her. <laughs> and so he gave me her number in the past van going to set next Monday in front of everybody and turned to me and said you better call her <laughs> because well you just better call her <laughs> so we went on a motorcycle ride and now it's been five years yeah. five and a half five and a half years. <laughs> excuse me so it was that it was the thoughtfulness it was the thoughtfulness and the ability to listen to listen to other people's opinions without forming her own initially and part of that came from the documentaries that she makes is she's very open to listening to these people without judging them and I think that's really important mm -hmm. because everyone has a different life experience you can't blame them for that you can't blame them for their life experience you can just try to understand it and try and understand them A man who's trying to find 
uh, a woman that would not fight the concepts that he wants her to understand needs to look for someone who is open to learning and researching and questioning and someone who hasn't decided that they already know the answers because once you've become locked in your ways you're boxing yourself in you're not letting new concepts resonate and if if you're open to new ideas then there's nothing that you can't learn I mean and it, this really is just learning it's not like it's just more information that's all it is and you should always want more information my hopes for the red pill are that it saves lives and that it helps people who feel like they're abandoned and they don't feel like their voice is being heard and they don't feel like anyone agrees with them because this is this is for people who don't feel like they can speak and it's to be able to get out um, to get past the initial talking points to be able to get deeper into these issues because it goes so much deeper in so many ways and in so many directions and but if you can get past this whole the initial reaction of Ugh, I can't I can't listen to these people they're against my feminist ideals if you can get past that and just accept it as information and good information that has reliable sources incredible sources behind it then you can start to learn and grow and I hope that this will allow that conversation to happen, especially between couples. Um, because I know that there are a lot of men dating feminist women that want to say these things, and they know exactly what will happen if they do, which is gonna be that they're, they're gonna get, or she's gonna hop in the car and threaten to drive away, or you're gonna sleep on the couch, <laughs> or what have you, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a terrifying concept to lose the love from the woman in your life because of ideals that you want to ally yourself with and that you might believe in. I think another fascinating aspect of the Manosphere is the Gamergate community. If you can call that an aspect of the Manosphere. I know they're very separate, but it does have to do with the silencing that's happening um, for anybody that wants to um, challenge the, the mantra, the, the, the dialectic that's currently in popular culture, and they really got silenced. Um, and that's one of the biggest issues that I think this move, well, these people, not even necessarily this movement, because some of these people just want to talk and they're not even aligned with the movement. Um, but just being silenced and not being allowed to speak, I mean, that's a fundamental right as an American, it's a constitutional right, it's freedom of speech, and it's being, I mean, that's, it's, it's amazing to me that something can be unconstitutionally just shut up, and that that's okay for so many people, and that that's right, and they shouldn't be allowed to talk about these things, and it's happening on Twitter, and it's happening on Facebook, and it's just, this is not what, this is not what those things are supposed to be about. They're supposed to be about freedom of speech and being able to share ideas and challenge ideas and make people angry if you want to because that's the internet's supposed to be a free space. <laughs> yeah, well, let's see what conversations we have that may be the pinhole in the next rabbit hole that we're going to travel down. Uh, yeah, I, we don't know the next film yet, but we want to see how people react to the red pill and see if they want to see another film with my approach to trying to hear all sides and let the audience uh, trust that the audience is intelligent enough to make their own opinion. Um, so, well, hopefully keep making films. <laughs> Definitely.